So I think that's a great way to get into kind of how you ended the book, which is which is with your you know, the way that you talked about just now what what you think will happen, but you you did lay out some examples of of ways that you think we can think about restructuring ourselves as a society to deal with with these deflationary forces. Um, you know, what do you think would be the way without revolution? What is that going to look like? So if you go back to is deflation good or bad, right? There needs to be a reset of debt around the world or, or, some, uh, or something to be able to bridge. So I'm not suggesting that it's one thing, but I, I did lay out a, a simple uh, premise. It's going to sound crazy, but, but, but we, I, I think we might be asking the wrong question. Governments all around the world, uh, every, every government, how do we protect our high paying jobs? How do, we, how do we gain more high paying jobs? And as a consequence, in a deflationary world, we need to print to be able to do it, right? We need to, we need, need. but what if we're asking the wrong question? What if the question is, how do, how do we build a society where we don't need them, right? The, and so what if we let deflation happen and prices just kept going lower and lower? Um, and, and we, as jobs fell out of the market, you didn't have to have this massive transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor to be able to, to, to drop the people that were left off of the, the path of deflationary, deflation. Because if it's true that technology is gonna do more and more of these jobs, wouldn't it seem logical to build a society where we can benefit from that technology instead of stuck in an old framework where we have to drive higher, pay, higher and higher paying jobs when we know they're not going to be there? Why don't we let it happen? In fact, capitalism itself would work perfectly there. Um, we don't live in a capitalist society anymore. We live in crony capitalism where, where we're, if we're printing money, capitalism itself, allowing things to fail and where you're actually paid for your difference in ingenuity and everything else, not because you have assets that were artificially uh, priced, would work perfectly if you let deflation happen. But what if we're starting from a place of too too great of inequality, where the the people at the bottom of the pyramid don't have enough um, as those deflationary forces kick in to be able to survive. You know, if prices drop to zero immediately and we go from you know a world of scarcity to a post scarcity capitalist economy immediately and everything costs cost next to nothing, then yeah, people can live off of their savings. Their they're non-existent savings. I mean, people don't have any money at all. Uh, there's huge amounts of people who have less than $500 in savings. Uh, that, that's some serious deflation that we would need to be able to go to a world where $500 in savings and no job is going to be able to, to get you through life. So let's, let, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. So today you have a problem, and let's just take what you just said. There's a whole bunch of people without $500 in sa savings. And I agree with that. There's a whole bunch of people. How will artificially printing more money solve that, their problem, right? Because, because what, you, what you will do there is house prices will go up, stock prices will go up, rent prices will go up. They don't participate in any of those. And their dollars will be worth less and less as you drive inflation and, and they won't be able to. So, so the current path cannot work. That's what, it, that's what I'm getting at. The new path, how, that, how we transition to something I'm not saying there's too much debt in the world today. There's over $250 trillion of debt in the world to run an $80 trillion world economy. Um, it, uh, that debt is going to have to be figured out at some point on a, on, tra on a transition. But what I'm saying is that transition is going to happen whether we like it or not. Your show talks about a bit about Bitcoin. Um, I believe it's one of the things in my portfolio, it's, it's my hedge against this. It could go to zero, it could, but uh, it, it has risk, it has up and down risk. But, but I actually believe it's, it, it's one of those things that it, as governments debase their currencies and they're going to have to continue to do so, then what is a currency? It's just a trust in an exchange rate. I give you, I, I lend you my, my money, I lose utility of money today and you, gain, and you have the inverse. You gain utility of money today, which you can spend and you lose it later with interest. And, and if that's an exchange between us or countries or companies and everything else, and you pretend to, if you change the denomination and you change your utility of money to pretend to pay me back, 
I start to lose trust in the currency. And that, that currency breakdown is likely what's going to happen at, at, at some point, point. So whether it's Bitcoin or a form of, 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 of trust, that I see that as a really good hedge against, uh, against what's happening. Because at some point, it's, the existing system is going to break. And I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you there. But I was more trying to get at, you said, without a transfer of wealth. That was the phrase that, that I kind of touched on. And, and that there is a group of people who, who, no matter how deflationary we get, there, there is going to have to be some transfer of wealth. Or it doesn't matter if we restructure the debts. They don't really care about, about the debts. They, they care about being able to afford a house, being able to afford health care, being able to put, to put food on their table. And, and even if we restructure the global debt, and people stop debasing the currency, and we have cheap prices, they're still not going to be able to do that. And, and so the natural, I mean, I'm kind of leading into UBI and, and those sorts of other things, but I think that in the world that you're describing, it's almost undoubtable that, that those, those things would be a part of it. Well, let's look at both sides of the political spectrum, right? And, and let's, or the socialism versus capitalism. Um, and on, on socialism, so if a lot, so a, if a large part of the uh, population drops out and there's only a few people at the top making an enormous amount of money, then there's either going to be revolution where those people take the money, right? And, and that can form at some point in the future, and that's going to come in the form, first it's going to be way higher taxes on wealth, right? That's the whole path on one side of the political spectrum, way higher taxes to pay for the people that have dropped out, right? That's, that's one part. And if you add to that, that more and more jobs are gonna leave and more and more monopolies out of, uh, out of artificial intelligence are, are gonna be created, there's gonna be very few people at the very top, right? So that's the path, that's the path that current, the current world is on. And, and so what that looks like on, this current, on that current path on the, on the socialist side is more and more taxes, more and more taxes, more and more taxes to pay for the other. And if you don't do that, revolution at some point. On a capitalist uh, side, uh, 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 side is it's hard to see your, I'm an entrepreneur, it's hard to see what you believe is uh, uh, created from your ingenuity being given to somebody else. So less taxes, less taxes, uh, uh, less taxes, um, and, and, and more in a free market. We don't live in a free market anymore if, if you have to produce $185 trillion of debt to, to create growth. So a free market would be you didn't need to do that. Um, and so, so both right now, um, and, and what you have is, uh, if you talk about UBI as an example, UBI says, okay, let's give everybody a working wage and, we'll, and, and, and that'll make the problem go away. But if you think about the, the, the trying to make that happen in society today, right? So imagine a person wants to live in New York because they think jobs are higher, uh, prospects are higher there, but also the rents are way higher uh, here um, and they don't have a job. Do you pay them more, right? Or somebody that, uh, that has, a, a, has a, a needy child or something, do you pay them more? So because you're taking from the wealthy, and giving to the, the left out of society on UBI, you raise a whole bunch of cornucopia of other problems that, that divide society for, further. But ultimately, if you look at the inflation-deflation debate, right, instead of that, and you say where we're going, then, then UBI, all it does is sits on top of the existing system that we've, we've had forever, right? And, and it doesn't, so it doesn't talk about a first principle, right, for, from which deflation is. So if we're going to have deflation, now UBI might need to be there as a transfer to something else. There might be a whole bunch of other things that are needed as, as, as we transfer econ uh, economies. But if the underlying thing is it's going to be more and more deflationary going forward, I don't see how, why sh we should talk about that. <laughs> Right, because that's a, that's the most important thing to how societies are built today, or how economies are built today. I guess what I'm saying is the revolutions will be perpetual. If, if you don't, if, if you, you don't have some sort of UBI, that the revolutions will be perpetual in this deflationary world. Because you know, 
Exactly. Once, once the deflationary forces are truly understood and, and people aren't taught, taught this other side of things, then will you even move to New York because the, the jobs are better? Or are you moving to New York because you like, like nobody's going to be looking for jobs. You'll have no motivation to look for a job. The, the, the chance of success in you becoming one of that top percent of, of people who is, who is able to, to participate in this you know, kind of end game uh, economy where things are automated, AI is, is thinking for us, and energy is extremely cheap. So These are hard concepts to, to gra grapple with, but it doesn't make them not true. And, and so uh, economics is driven by scarcity and technology creates abundance. And so we're sitting in the studio right now and the, the most valuable thing is the air we breathe. Without it, we die in a couple minutes. Yet it's free because it's abundant. Um, and, and so through that, through that lens, and it's hard to see, you could create a model for air or oxygen underwater where it's scarce. You could create a model for oxygen if we pollute our air so badly that it becomes scarce. But without that, is free because it's abundant. And technology creates abundance everywhere. And, and it's going to be, it's not just in your phones anymore. Um, it, it look back and look at your phone, phone. Like it's hard to believe that, that, that uh, my first phone was $2,000. My first phone bill was $1,200 and all it did is made phone calls. It's, it's hard to believe what I have free on my phone today and, and that, uh, that abundance. That technology isn't now just in our phones, it's moving to every part of society. And so why wouldn't we logically expect that to, to, uh, to see that? And if we could see that, we could, we could drive a really exciting future, a future of abundance for everybody. The, the path to that is gonna be challenging. <laughs> the path to, but the path to that right now, if you look out your window, if you look at the political divide, not just in the United States, but all over the world, it's already there, right? And, and burying our heads in the sand and saying that that's, uh, that's not going to get worse, I think is, uh, um, is ignorant. I think it's gonna get a lot worse. Yeah, well, it sounds like we're really discussing a world that's post-scarcity and that, that a post-scarcity world, a lot of the, the economic concepts which we hold as, as truths are, are proven to be false. And that, and that we need to, to reconsider how we, how we restructure ourselves moving forward to, to understand this, this new world of po post-scarcity economy. That's the debate should, we should be having. That is a debate at political circles, around the world, at all sorts of, that's the debate we should be having. It's an important, uh, it's an important debate. And I think that's kind of, if you look at the candidacy, you know, the, the former candidacy of Andrew Yang, that's, that's what he was trying to have um, with him throwing himself into the ring and, and now, the the democratic debate has gone a little bit back towards you know uh, looking at the the symptoms exactly. the symptoms of this deflationary issue and and Yang to me you know this is, this is all personal personal opinion here but Yang to me was the one who was looking at these these causes of deflation and saying this is what we need to be talking about not not these these really symptoms of the even problem. if his policy response on UBI might not uh, 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 that might not be the response. At least he was somebody that was active in, in, in the debate around the first principles. And I agree with you. It's an intellectual debate around what we need to do rather than throwing stones.